Shout of praise, hallelujah. champion, Lord. Every battle you've won, you are victorious. And in you, I'm victorious. You are my champion, Lord. You are my champion, Lord. Worship me.
Holy Spirit, we welcome you here tonight. We welcome your presence in this place. And wherever we are, Lord. We thank you for your presence always among us. that you would do tonight what it is that you want to do. We come with open hearts, open minds, ready to worship you, Lord. with your heart. Just enter his presence with
This is your kingdom, Jesus, come. You're the Father, this is your home.
started Adoration Night well over a year ago at this point. It started as a night for people to come and encounter God and to interact with them in worship and adoration, but also in, in, in any way they felt led or in the way that they were able to do so the most effectively. Where they were able to connect with the heart of God. So I just want to bring a reminder to that tonight. And just to encourage everyone, whether you're here with us or you're watching on the live stream, encounter God tonight. Whether that means you dance, whether that means you sit and interact with Him in the quiet, whether that means you wave a banner, if that means that you sit and you receive revelation in the Word or in your journal, just do that tonight. However you want to interact with, with God, or however the Holy Spirit leads you to do so, just feel the freedom to do that tonight. There's not a specific formula to how adoration night is supposed to go.
everything that's in me. This is holy name.
lets them know when something's coming. And uh, I want to read a couple passages out of 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians before we go on about the rest of our evenings. Because I think there's something very important. Because if you notice, in, in Matthew 24, it talks about there will be pestilences in the end times. There will be wars and rumors of wars. It says there will be earthquakes in various places. Um, and I know that we've seen all these things increasing over time. We've seen them happen more and more. I mean, the bubonic plague is back in China. There's some person that got it there. It's, it's, it's insane. And everybody has their solutions, right? Buy American, don't travel, wear a mask, do this, do that. Everyone has their, their solution. I, just want you, I want to remind you all that are here tonight and anybody that may be watching online what's happening. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting with verse 13. It says, We don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, those who have died. Though that you may not grieve as others who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by the word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. So he's making a, a statement that there are going to be some people alive on this planet when Jesus returns. Then he says, the Lord himself will descend from heaven. And it says a few things will happen. First, there will be a cry of command with the voice of an archangel. So an archangel is going to give a cry of a command. And then the trumpet of God will sound. Then the dead in Christ will rise. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So Paul is saying there's going to be this series of events that's going to happen. First, the Lord's going to descend. Then there's going to be a command from an archangel. There's going to be a trumpet. Then the dead in Christ are going to rise. I have no idea what that's going to look like. It says they're coming with him in the Lord in the air, so that has to be their spirit man. So, you know, we talk about that song, Come Out of That Grave. What a wild day that's going to be. Dead in Christ rise. I mean, I just imagine graves grave just exploding and glorified bodies popping out to meet their spirit man. But see, there is going to be some of us, it says, in a moment, a twinkling of an eye. We will be changed. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's like we're going to be, we are alive and remain are going to be instantly changed. Then it goes on, it says, Now concerning the times and seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Now isn't that interesting? He says you're fully aware the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Getting robbed by a thief and being fully aware seems contradictory, but he goes on and he explains that. So while people are saying there is peace and security, sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. So there's going to be these people that are going to be proclaiming peace and safety. Everything's going to be all right. You just do what we say. Just follow our rules and everything's going to be okay. It says sudden destruction will come as labor pains. And we know how labor pains operate. They intensify as birth is getting closer. They intensify and become more frequent. Labor pains is used many times in end times prophetic literature. But then he goes on, he says, but you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. Remember, we are fully aware that he's coming like a thief. So we're not going to be surprised as long as we're paying attention to the signs. It goes on, it says, for you are all children of the light, children of the day, 
We are not of the night nor of darkness, and let us not sleep as others sleep. Let us keep awake and be sober. Now he's talking about spiritual sleep and spiritual sobriety here. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. So he's using a natural event of getting drunk and sleeping to make a spiritual comparison. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, for the helmet, the hope of salvation. Now, we know that's a call back to Ephesians where he mentions the armor of God. Here's where I think it gets real important. It says, For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, whether we are awake or asleep, that we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. God has not appointed us to wrath. Now, why would he say that? Why would he say God has not appointed us for wrath? That seems obvious. He writes a follow-up letter because his first letter confused some folks in Ephesus, and they were wondering if they'd already missed the return of the Lord. Now, how could you miss the return of the Lord and still be on this planet? Well, that is where the thought of the rapture of the church comes in, which would be a kind of different topic. Um, what I'm really just wanting to show you is that God is showing his children that his return is near. And he is giving us a chance to prepare ourselves, just like a warning shot. What is the purpose of a warning shot? A warning shot is to get everyone out of harm's way before the actual shot comes. You fire a warning shot and say, look, Get out of here before it gets serious. This is now concerning in, uh, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, which is a recall back to 1 Thessalonians 4. This is, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has already come. So the Thessalonian church was freaking out because they thought the Lord had already come and taken his church and they had been left. Right. I, I left that out on purpose. Yeah, they had been left. And uh, he said by a spirit, a spoken word, or a letter. So there's going to be spirits that try to deceive. There's going to be spoken words, people that speak that try to deceive. And there were letters that were trying to deceive. It says, let no one deceive you in any way. And this is where it gets interesting. For that man will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship. So he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming to be God. Now, this is a call back to Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, where Jesus said, when you see the, uh, the, uh, the abomination that causes desolation is spoken by the prophet. So here's what we know is going to happen. Okay, we get all these warning shots there is going to be a return of the Lord. But first, before that happens, something happens. Let me just keep reading. And so there's going to be this, this God figure that tries to set himself up as God and take his place in the seat of God, which we know in different areas of the Bible is called the Antichrist. So if we don't see that, then we know Jesus hasn't come yet. But, but then listen to this. This is where it gets important. It says, do you not remember while I was with you? I told you these things, and you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed. So is there, there's this restraining force that is keeping the Antichrist at bay. Whether he's alive on this planet right now, which he very well could be, or if he's yet to be born, there is a restraining force that is keeping him at bay. And that restraining force is not called an it. It's not called a she. It's called a he. Now, what is the force that is at work on this earth right now? It is the Holy Spirit. And I believe firmly that's what this is talking about. So before the man of lawlessness is revealed, remember, it's previously God's children are not pointed to wrath, but before the son of lawlessness is revealed, there is this restraining force that is removed out of the way.
Now let me ask you a question. Would Jesus take the Holy Spirit without taking his church? See, that would fly in the face of the promise of Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20. says, Lord, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Because there's several verses where it says he'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. We're not appointed to wrath. And folks, I'm not making this up. I'm not being uh, hardcore dispensational. I'm just telling you the word of God. It says the lawless, number, the lawless one will be revealed. So anybody ever giving you directions and they say, if you get to the such and such, then you've passed it up. Go back. That's what Paul is doing here. Okay? If you've seen the Antichrist, then you know you've missed the return of the Lord. It's really interesting after this. It says, the Lord Jesus will kill him with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all the power and false signs and wonders. So he is going to walk in the full power of Satan, able to produce false signs and wonders. And with all the wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to believe the tr truth and to be saved. So the people that are left on this planet are going to be either people that didn't know about Jesus or they refused the truth and refused to be saved. Now contextually, those who refuse the truth and refuse to be saved, it says, therefore God sends them a strong delusion so they may believe what is false, in order that they may be condemned, who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So there's going to come a time when those that have heard the gospel message and rejected it over and over again are going to be so deceived because the spirit of deception is going to be released on this planet after the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way. Can you imagine the Holy Spirit not being active in this, in this planet? And then a spirit of deception being released, false signs and wonders, an antichrist uh, touting himself as God. Now, if we go into Revelation, we know there's also a one world government, a one world economic system, a one world religion. Folks, all that stuff is coming and we're seeing the warning shots. So this is a time for God's people to panic. This is a God's time for God's people to run around and say the sky is falling. No, this is a time for God's people to shine. This is a time for God's people to rise up and be who they've been called to be. Because in my mind, there, there is no more evidence in existence than there is today that God is real. When we see the things happening and we see the prophecies in the Bible being fulfilled, I'm not given a timeline because I have no idea. That's all I know is while God's church may be persecuted by the world, we are not going to be persecuted by God. He is not going to allow us to suffer his wrath. He's going to take us out of the way before that happens. I believe that every child of God needs to study end times theology. I'll tell you a few resources that I feel that you could really use that could help you tremendously. Okay, one of them is a Schofield Reference Bible. Okay, a Schofield Reference Bible. It really breaks this stuff down from Genesis to Revelation. You can get one at Word of God Christian Bookstore uh, if they still have them in stock for about $30. Highly recommend it. Another Bible that I recommend, I can't believe I'm recommending it because the guy was a little strange, but Finnis Dake um, had a Bible called Dake's Annotated Reference Bible. And the only reason I ask you to, to consider these is because they break down these events and show you through the scripture what's going on, and we can give ourselves an idea. Uh, the times and the seasons, we don't know. We can have an idea. And I have an idea that we could be very well the generation that sees the return of Christ. I don't know what it'll look like. I don't know if it's going to be pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib, or whatever. But I do know that we are not going through the wrath, and we are not going to be under the rule of the Antichrist. There is no scriptural evidence that will support that in any way, shape, or form. But those two Bibles 
would be very good resources for and these men were imperfect their theology is not perfect but at least it will give you an idea Dake has some weird stuff in it but if you use it for its end times teaching I would consider that solid just a couple things another thing that I think uh, would be helpful for you is a life in the spirit study Bible that one's a little more expensive but it gives you some pretty good teaching on end times uh if you go searching on the internet, it can get weird. These are resources that I trust that have been solid, that I've used, and uh, I would consider completely accurate, or as accurate as a man can get it. Let's put it that way. There are certain things we cannot possibly know. But folks, now is a time to prepare. Now is a time to get ready. Uh, if you were going on a trip, you wouldn't wait till the morning of the trip to pack. Uh, you would probably pack the night before. You'd probably start getting supplies even days before. Um, you would probably get your car maintenance. You get somebody to watch the dog. There's, there's all these preparations you would make for a trip. So we need to make preparations. And you know what? Whether it's one year, 20 years, 50 years, all that's irrelevant. Because if Jesus does not come back in our lifetime, we still have to be prepared for him at the end of our lives. So that's just kind of the call that I will give to you all today is get ready. Get ready. Because the return of the Lord is imminent. We don't know exactly when. We don't know exactly how, but it's imminent. So, Father, we thank you. That, Lord, you don't leave us without signs. You don't leave us without warnings. But you tell us. You tell us and you show us. So, Lord, help us to pay attention to the signs, just like we pay attention to road signs that tell us when we're getting near our destination or tell us how fast to go or tell us where to turn or tell us when to stop and tell us when to go. Help us to pay attention to the signs. Lord, help us to pay attention to the Spirit, the voice of the Lord. Help us not to play games. Lord, this is not the time for Christians to play games. But Lord, help us not also to walk in fear. Help us not to doubt our salvation. Help us not to doubt your goodness. Because we knew. Lord, the Bible says in the last days, perilous times will come. People will be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. They'll be disobedient and lawless. We, we're not surprised by any of this, Lord. We may be startled because it's happening right in front of our eyes. We're certainly not surprised. You've been warning about this for millennia. So, Lord, use us today to be an example to the people that are afraid. Help them to see our confidence. Help us to see our resolve. Help them to see our joy in knowing that one day we're going to be redeemed. In Jesus' name, amen.